if everything that you spend in your office, let's say equates to $10,000 a month, I'm throwing a random number out, and you have exactly sales of $15,000 every month at that rate, can you double your spend to $20,000 a month and get back $30,000 in sales? I am enjoying this absolutely gorgeous San Francisco day in this Mercedes SLK convertible and right now I'm about to descend what according to the guidebooks is San Francisco's steepest decline. I say decline, it should be really incline but it's a one way street going downhill. So you could see we're like whoosh, heading straight down. Today we are going to talk about lean operations. If you're familiar with what that is you may have an idea what I'm going to talk about but if you're not. Well, it was started originally by the founder of Toyota. Lean operations means, oh my God, it's so steep here. Lean operations means that you only provide as much resources as you need for the immediate future and you don't spend resources on things you don't need right now. That's the general concept of lean. In the case of Toyota, when they originated it, that meant that if they knew they built 100 cars in a day, they only had parts for 100 cars that day. The next day, they got a new delivery of another 100 parts or something of that nature. Now, the side effect of lean is lack of re redundancy, meaning that if something goes wrong in your supply chain, you don't really have excess inventory. So that's a side effect. We're gonna learn from this today how you can utilize that for your business all right even if you're not even manufacturing you could be a software business you don't have any concrete products the idea of lean is you never really um, spend more than you need to you cut costs at every level of the operation six sigma is another aspect of lean not an aspect of lean another counterpart that works well with lean. Six Sigma means no, uh, almost no points of failure. So if you go, let's say you're building, I don't know, this car. Instead of just trying to count the points of failure that happen every 10 cars you build, there's three things wrong. You figure out when you're building this car, how many problems are in the engine, how many problems are in the seats, how many problems are in the steering wheels they produce. And if you can get all of those problems uh, to a very minimal level, then you end up with a very reliable product. That's the principle of Six Sigma. I, there's a math equation that goes with that that I'm not gonna go into now. It's beyond the scope of this uh, video. However, the idea behind this is to reduce defects at every level and to reduce spend at every level. And by doing that, you become a very lean operation, okay? It's not just an industry term, it's also the English uh, vernacular of it makes perfect sense. Now, why would you wanna do that? Why would you wanna take away the uh, luxury features that you might have that you're spending more money on? Why would you wanna take away the resiliency of having excess inventory? Okay, so the obvious reason right off the bat is the ability to pivot. Let's say things don't always go exactly according to plan. You wanna change your direction with your business. If you have a lot of excess inventory or you've invested a lot of time, let's say it's software, you have programmed 100,000 features into your software, it's hard to turn back and actually do anything to uh, change that later. So the idea is if you only build minimally viable product, MVP, then when you actually go to deploy the thing, if it doesn't work, you've invested the least amount possible. So that's part of the idea behind lean. You have the minimal amount of investment at every stage of the, of the uh, venture. Now, on top of that, okay, if you decide, oh my God, people in San Francisco, they cross so slowly. In New York, when they see someone waiting, they like go quicker. Here, they just take their time. I'm not used to that. I know it's probably, I probably sound impolite, but <laughs> it's just, I ain't used to this. Anyhow, all right, so if you have a, the need to pivot, it's always better to have less invested in. That's, that's one of the key points. If you have an office and you need to close doors, let's say the whole business fell through. The less you invested, the easier it is to liquidate your assets. That's the, that's the whole thing. So why would you not want to, why would you want to spend more is a big question. I mean, obviously you get some sense of um, comfort 
when you know that you have excess, but at the same time, an ideal business operates at the minimal level of spend. So now, what exactly does this all mean? What does it mean, minimal spend? Where is this spending going to? Well, the biggest cost in majority of businesses is employees, HR, human resources. How many employees do you really need? Maybe you can outsource some of the elements that you you that you are paying for someone to do in-house outbound and make more money that way lean operations that's what that means all right if you can get some guy in china to do an equivalent quality of work to the guy you're paying in new york city or here in san francisco you're probably going to end up financially ahead that's lean, that's a form of lean operations now there are other aspects of lean operations how about just the ordinary burn of the things that cost you money in an office stupid things like toilet paper have you ever calculated actually how much money paper goods and other and other consumables cost in your office if you have a lot of people and i've managed uh com commercial spaces where you'll have 100 people going in and out in one day it adds up real quick now i don't believe in being cheap about certain things so like i won't get cheap and use one ply toilet paper I buy Charmin even if you got a hundred people by the way this is that famous uh, crooked street they call it uh, here in San Francisco the one that zigzags so I don't buy I don't buy cheap stuff like I, I, I wouldn't buy cheap toilet paper and the reason for that is it bites you back okay it, it, if you if people don't enjoy, don't have a good time in, using the bathroom they don't want to stay in your office. That's reality. So I'm not saying be cheap, but if you find a place to buy wholesale Charmin toilet paper, you end up pretty far ahead than if you keep going to the 7-Eleven or the retail store down the corner to supply yourself with, I don't know, $2 a roll toilet paper. So the idea is if you can cut costs at every single level, you end up with a reduced operational expense. And that helps, holy cow, this is a lot going on here. Uh, and that helps in the bottom line of your business. This all equates to better scaling. You can scale your business easier if your operations are lean. Hang on, there's a guy with a ladder in the middle of, oh my God, he's, he, oh my God, he's power spraying the walls. I'm in a convertible, it's coming down on me. <laughs> oh boy. All right, he's got, a, he's got a power water sprayer thing. All right, anyway. Now, you can scale easier if you know your exact operational expenses and can keep them really low. And what I mean by this is, if everything that you spend in your office, let's say equates to $10,000 a month, I'm throwing a random number out, and you have exactly sales of $15,000 every month at that rate, can you double your spend to $20,000 a month and get back $30,000 in sales? Sometimes you can. It depends a lot on your business model. It's, that's not a one-size-fits-all equation. But there are occasions where if you know your exact operational expense, you are much more equipped to scale up. That's the whole thing. Now, on the other side, one thing to be very careful of is do not do what's called premature optimization, okay? Do not try to start scaling up your business and optimizing every last thing about it to make it perfect before you deploy it and burn through enormous amount of expenses doing so. That's all, this all goes with lean operations. It's part of MVP, minimally viable product. It's very important you do things at a minimal level until they are proven and then only add features after after they are proven to be necessary and a demand for them okay that's one of the aspects of MVP minimally viable product you want to make sure people actually want what you're adding okay if you're adding features if you are selling new product lines all these things don't do what's called gold plating gold plating is an in another industry term for adding things that look good, that make it look better, but don't actually add functionality to what you're doing. Um, like a lot of times people will make a website and they'll start adding things that move and blink and do all these things and nobody really wants that. It's actually kind of annoying or the worst offender for web-based uh, businesses in my personal opinion is we've redesigned the website. We've changed features, added features, took away ones no one used, Leave the stupid thing alone. If I'm a, 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 
a long time customer the last thing I want is that you gold plated your website because you made a redesign and everything's harder to use just leave it alone when it works when it works leave it alone sometimes you do have to modify things for security or, or that kind of thing like if you have if, uh, security breach is a possibility as time goes on there are security implications to keeping old websites so I'm not saying never do any maintenance or anything of like that but don't change things for the sake of changing them. That's gold plating. Don't say, oh, we like the way it looked better now, therefore we changed it. You have clients using it. That was a completely unnecessary expense. Think lean. How can you minimize your expenses? Can you, and let's say you're a product business. I'm gonna throw another good one out here. I like this one. Can you get the product you're paying for for free somehow? That's a great answer. Can you get it for free or near free? Seriously. The last time I furnished an office, a brick and mortar office, I spent several grand on tables, on desks and chairs. After I did that, it occurred to me what I should have done and what I will do the next opportunity I have to furnish an office, go on Craigslist. Maybe someone has the exact same tables I bought from Ikea, giving them away for free or for near free. That's possible. People give stuff away all the time for free. If you can get it for free, that's as lean operations as you can get. Now, mind you, cheap pays double. Do not get cheap, meaning don't start taking things out of the trash bin and then you end up getting termites or, or lice or something in your office. I'm not implying to do, do something stupid. That I'm not. I made a big circle, so I'm gonna go back down Lombard Street, the Crooked Street for, for fun. Hey, it's fine, why not? Um, do not just do not get so cheap with things that you lose sight of the big picture, okay? If you end up chasing things on Craigslist, let's say you need 25 desks in your office, you're not gonna likely find that on Craigslist, okay? It depends, maybe you can. Maybe someone else is closing their office and has 25 desks. However, if you're gonna lose a month of operations because you don't have furniture, furnishings to save a few bucks, that's also not a good idea. Remember, you're paying rent, that's part of your burn rate. Every day costs you money. You should know what it costs for every single day of both of operation and days of closed doors, meaning the weekend when people typically don't work, at least in the, in the United States. How much does it cost you each day of that month, both operational days and non-operational days? That number is very important because you need to pull in enough money in income revenue to cover that. Premature optimization, I mentioned that before. I'm gonna give another example. There's someone I know who I'm gonna keep this vague enough that he can't tell I'm talking about him, but he purchased a, oh, how do I make this vague so I don't, I don't pinpoint, it, uh, pinpoint him. All right, he has a environment where he does educational services. He literally just opened doors in this place, okay? He, it's, a, it's like an educational services office, you could say. This guy bought, I think, 50 tables, or maybe 60, I think it was 60, 60 different desks for students, planning to have 60 students simultaneously the day he opens doors. He spent thousands of dollars on furnishings and renovation and all this, and now he has got a classroom for 60 different uh, students to take professional educational programs. Now. What's the problem with this? Is he just opened doors, he's got no clients at all, zero. He started from the beginning. He could have opened the doors in half the amount of time if he didn't aim so high and maybe made 10, 15 seats and added the seats as he goes along. Instead, he spent thousands of dollars on, on, in, uh, on computers for each student, on desks and chairs and things like this, thousands. Now, fast forward two months, and it's proven that I'm correct, my, my estimate, that you have to do things lean. He's only got 10 students at a time in there and 60 desks. It looks ridiculous, 50 empty desks in a room all the time. It's silly looking, and he spent a lot of money on it. He should have started small and built up as the idea is proven. Minimally viable product, not gold plating, lean operations. These things are all very important for any business it doesn't matter whether you have a service a product you're selling operational things you're selling academia which is what this guy was doing or formal academia professional academia doesn't matter what you're selling always keep the cost as low as possible it reduces your risk if everything goes sour and you need to liquidate assets it's so much easier when you have less product when you have less 
furnishings in in an environment when you have less money invested into the product. It's much easier to close doors. Simple as that. Or pivot. Let's say today you are selling lemons. I'm just going to throw an example. I know nothing about agricultural business, but today you're selling lemons. It turns out nobody freaking wants to drink lemonade, lemons, lemon juice during this time of year. So you start building lemon, uh, bottled lemonade from your resources. This was a this is a pivot of operational uh, operational pivot. Very normal example. Something I know nothing about. I have no idea if that's realistic or not for that business line. But theoretically speaking, you're no longer packing these lemons up in packages and shipping them off in boxes. You're now packaging in bottles the juice that it makes, and there's a process involved. You don't want to have 35,000 tons of boxes for these lemons sitting around because now you can't get rid of them all the boxes i'm talking about the the shipment boxes you want to have only as much as the containers the shipment containers for these lemons this is a really weird example i I know that you only want to have as much containers as you needed for a a substantial amount of time two weeks a month whatever whatever your operational uh, cycle is because then when you switch to selling lemonade you need a different kind of resource to actually ship out the product and now you have no space in space for these things. Nobody really wants them. Oh, I have another example. Nobody wants your old inventory. There's a guy who I also know. This guy, he tried to make some kind of fancy high-end um, baby powder, I think it was. I don't know. It was some kind of baby, it was like a baby powder thing. And he bought an entire truckload, 30,000 pounds of empty containers. Uh, and maybe that's not 30,000 pounds if they were empty. It's probably a 15,000 pound load of empty containers of baby powder. Business couldn't was terrible. He couldn't find one retailer to carry this stuff. Literally a total fail. He didn't actually build a product yet, which is in his favor. That's his luck. He only tried to get orders for it. Couldn't get anybody, but he had all these bottles. He has no idea what to do with 15,000 pounds of empty baby powder containers. That's how not to start this. You started off with, I don't know, 500 containers. You don't buy 15,000 pounds of them. You start off with 500, get some orders. When the orders start coming in, you start buying more more, more, uh, more goods to actually create to fulfill the orders. Incremental, don't go crazy with stuff, you know? People get these ideas that they're gonna be the next big thing. I once um, was asked to give some feedback on a new venture to somebody. He wanted to create an ad, an ad uh, platform, online ad platform, similar to Google AdSense or any of those things. All right, there's so many of them. Every every big company has them, and they dominate. This guy wanted to compete with them. What he was saying to me was, he's going to get so big that he's going to need to have his own caching mechanism. Caching is something that uh, web-based. Sorry about that. I was going over the trolley tracks. I apologize for the bumps. Caching is something that uh, big companies need when the servers are overwhelmed with the amount of traffic that they get. And he was saying that he's going to need to build his own caching mechanism rather than use mainstream ones because none of them would be able to handle the amount of traffic he would get. That is such an absurd notion. There are whole companies built around caching effectively. Why would you think that you're going to get so many customers doing something that Google already does and Yahoo already does and all these companies already do and somehow you're going to get so much customers that you're going to saturate the caching mechanisms? This is absurd. you got to really start small, start lean. What he should have done was launch the product at a minimally viable product, see if he can even get one customer. Honestly, I've never heard of this guy's company ever again. My guess is he threw a lot of money into it and it failed because he was not even open to listening to me. That's another point. Never be rigid with people when people give you advice. A lot of people get married to ideas and sometimes they're quite terrible, honestly. And I can only give my honest feedback. You can ignore it, you know, and other people will tell you and they, you can ignore them too and you'll just lose money. You gotta put the least amount of effort into every business. That is an utterly key business principle. Least amount of money possible, lean operations. Try it out, MVP, minimally viable product. Do not gold plate. Do not go crazy with the features or I need this. I don't want to launch without this because people are going to run away. No, that's not how it works. People will not run away if they like your product. They will run away if you put so many features in they can't figure out how to use the thing. All right, always, always, always put the minimal amount of effort into that still is enough 
sufficient to operate your business. Do not be cheap. I'm not saying that. Cheap pays double. Okay, you put, again, you, you don't buy sharp and toilet paper. You buy the one-ply stuff. People don't want to use the bathroom in your facility. They will not come again. You will lose them. <laughs> it's a stupid example, but the truth is paper consumable goods do cost a lot when you have a uh, office with a lot of people going in and out. And same thing with kitchen goods. If you have a, a, a kitchen or kitchen net in your facility, stupid things like coffee filters and, and things, I mean, they add up. All right. Now, of course, that's trivial compared to like the salary you're paying people. So obviously, if you can uh, imp optimize where you spend on the things that matter most first, that's much more important. But you should have a good idea every single day what your entire operational expenses from A to Z, from the toilet paper to the, mo to the highest paid employee, which every person is getting that day. And don't forget employees' salaries. If you're not familiar with paying employees legally, and that's a key factor there, legally. Um, what you actually pay them is so much more than both what they receive and what their actual salary is. Because that's Uncle Sam in the United States, man. Taxes are rough here. If the person has a salary of $20 an hour, they're probably only receiving after taxes about 13, but you have to pay social security tax and other things. So even though they're on the books for $20 an hour, you really end up paying them about 23 or $24 an hour. Everything adds up. So keep that in mind when you do your calculations. Know the genuine actual cost that you're paying your employees. Know how much things are every day and you will be a much better businessman for it, running a much more efficient operation. Come out to San Francisco. I'm all done with this uh, daily video, or not daily, but this today's video. Come on out to San Francisco. If you got a Mercedes convertible SLK, it makes it so much better. Oh my God, it's the ultimate car for this environment. Uh, come on out, and I'll see you all in the next video. Like, share, subscribe. Share this video with everyone you know, please. Even if you don't agree with me, even if you think you need to burn enormous quantities of funds, throw money away, flash your cash on a fancy Mercedes. <laughs> if you think you need to do that just to make your business go, God bless you. Even if you don't like what I'm saying, please share this with your friends. Hopefully uh, you'll come back and watch the next video. I appreciate the time you spend watching my videos. I know you don't get that time back. So I appreciate that a lot. Thank you all for watching. See you in the next video. Yeah! <laughs>